Good afternoon and thank you all for attending this open and public meeting between the window covering industry and CPSC staff. I am Dr. George Borlase, the head of the Office of Hazard Identification and Reduction, and I'm very pleased to welcome everyone to CPSC's National Product Test and Evaluation Center here in Rockville, Maryland. This meeting was requested by Mr. Ed Krennick of Bracewell, and we are here today to discuss uh, technologies currently available on window coverings and recent developments in window covering technology and design that reduce the risk of strangulation of young children from corded window coverings. I'd like to thank the WCMA Window Covering Manufacturers Association for the June 29, 2016 press release announcing that they initiated the process to revise the current voluntary window covering safety standard to effectively address the strangulation risk to children from products with accessible cords. CPSC staff, industry members at the table here today, and many of the audience members have been active participants in this voluntary standard activity, and CPSC staff look forward to working closely with everyone to develop an effective voluntary standard. The purpose of today's meeting is for CPSC staff to learn more about the ongoing industry innovations and new product development within the window covering industry and to hear from the industry how they plan to bring these new products and approaches to the voluntary standard meetings once they are initiated by the Window Covering Manufacturers Association. Today's discussion will be focused on the industry's work and how it will be brought to the voluntary standard meetings, but we will not be focused on specific voluntary standard changes. Those discussions will take place in the appropriate voluntary standard meetings led by the Standards Development Organizer, WCMA. Before I get to introductions and start the presentations, I'd like to go over some housekeeping and rules for today's meeting. First, in case of a fire or some other emergency, please quickly exit through the front doors that are behind some of you, in front of others of you, the doors you came in, and assemble in the parking lot when you come out to your left, closest to Interstate 270. If we do need to evacuate, it is essential everyone assemble outside, please, so we can make sure everyone is accounted for. Second, bathrooms are available uh, right here to my left, behind many of you, at the end of the hall, here and through the double doors. You do not need a pass or an escort to access the bathrooms. You can pass through the double doors to get to the bathrooms. Third, please remember to silence your cell phones, place them on vibrate, or please turn them off. I will note that while they are nearby, there are no Pokemon here in the building, so please <laughs> don't feel compelled to check your Pokemon Go account. Um, thank you for bearing with them. Got so many papers here, I'm trying to figure out which one's which. Today's meeting between the window covering industry engineers and CPSC staff was requested by Mr. Ed Krennick, and the presentations and discussions will be limited to those seated at the table. I ask that all audience members request, respect the meeting request and hold all comments and questions. For those on the phone, while we did mute it, um, please just be aware of that, and you, you could place your phone on mute also. Today's open meeting is being videotaped, and the video will be available on the CPSC website no, lo no later than one week from Friday. I would like to thank some of our guests and members of the public for joining us today, including Commissioner Robinson and Mr. Tyler Goodyear from Health Canada. Thank you for bearing with me on the admin items, and I'm thrilled to have this panel assembled today and to have this technical meeting. We have four representatives from the window covering industry, Mr. Tom Merker, from Springs Window Fashions, Mr. Jim Anthony from Hunter Douglas, Mr. Jeff Stout from Newell Rubbermaid, Mr. Derek Marsh from Rollies, good to see you all again, gentlemen, and we're also joined by Mr. Ralph Fasami, Executive Director of the WCMA. Participating of CPSC staff, myself, Dr. Joel Recht, Director for Engineering Sciences, Mr. Mark Kumagai, Director for the Division of Mechanical and Combustion Engineering, Dr. Rana Balsicina, the Director for the Division of Human Factors, and Mr. Kevin Lee, a mechanical engineer with Mr. Kumagai's division. Again, thank you everybody for attending, and without any further delay, I'm going to turn it over to our presenters. Thank you, George, um, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, also, on our part, thank you very much for agreeing to meet with us today. Um, as you have noted, we have announced the opening of the standard. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we were able to have an opportunity to cover today uh, the scope, the objectives of that standard, and, um, and some of the activities that uh, we intend to bring to the standard development process um, once our meetings begin. Okay. Um, first and, and, and foremost, uh, the, the, our purpose here today um, 
is to review the objectives uh, for the standard development process and make sure that the, uh, the scope uh, is well understood, to review the standard development process that we'll be utilizing and just re refresh, uh, to review some recent advancements and, uh, and some of the possible approaches in, uh, in standard development, uh, and to review next steps and timelines. Um, some of the trends that we have um, uh, witnessed and, and noticed um, in terms of just uh, U.S. Census Bureau trends, you know, we've seen the continued uh, uh, increase in household formation, uh, household and, and home, home sales are going up. So we know that there's going to be a continued uh, uh, growth in the number of windows and therefore the number of window coverings. Uh, we've noticed the growth in... Um, in uh, the population zero to five years old, uh, had a rapid increase up until about 2008 and 2009. It then has started to, uh, to peak a little bit, but it still uh, uh, points to uh, a very, a very uh, large amount of uh, consumer interaction with window coverings, and we believe that that will continue to grow. So we understand that what we're looking at from a demographic standpoint is, is increased opportunities for consumers to be in, in, uh, engaged with window coverings. Um, Tom, you want to talk a little bit about some of the product trends? As far as um, product trends go, we've seen growth in cordless sales. Uh, some categories uh, in shades like cellular Roman, <coughs> excuse me, where you already have a high percent of cordless, that continues to grow in uh, 20, 30 percent uh, over the last four to five years. And in categories that are uh, like horizontals, which are um, a vast majority of the products uh, that are made today, that is a smaller category in terms of cordless, very mature product category. Uh, so you don't see as much penetration in the cordless option, but we've seen a lot more growth, um, you know, in high percentages. Um, you know, 50%, 100% growth. But again, it's on a small segment of the business. Uh, one of the other uh, important factors that we, uh, we've seen in, um, in shaping, uh, you know, the, uh, the trends that are looking forward on, on window coverings and, and, uh, and consumer choice, um, certainly uh, the, uh, about a, a year, a little over, a little over a year ago, WCMA um, announced its Best for Kids program. And the Best for Kids program was a set of criteria uh, that were above and beyond the uh, standards. Uh, requirements uh, that were specifically designed to allow manufacturers and retailers and most of all consumers to easily select window coverings that were best suited for homes uh, in, uh, with young children. And the, uh, the acceptance of that by all three of those stakeholder groups has been, uh, has been very, very, very good. Um, uh, over over four, 35 to 40 companies have already signed up, manufacturing companies representing thousands and thousands of products uh, that are um, looking uh, and, and using the best for kids. It requires a third-party testing. Uh, it requires a labeling and a, and a, and a retesting provision. Uh, but most, uh, most importantly, it provides an opportunity for uh, for consumers to be able to, to choose products that are best suited for homes with children. Now, what has that done? From a technical standpoint, it has certainly uh, driven uh, manufacturers to produce products to meet those criteria or develop products that, uh, that can meet those criteria. Uh, it, is, uh, it is caught on uh, uh, with retailers, and retailers are now requesting of manufacturers uh, that their suppliers um, qualify and have products that qualify with best for kids criteria. Um, and it has also uh, allowed consumers to, uh, to, to recognize those products in a, uh, in, in a simpler fashion and retailers really to promote them. So from an awareness standpoint, that's been important, but also it's a, it's a driver not only of consumer behavior, but it's become a driver of manufacturers and retailers as well. So, um, so we think that that's, um, that that's an important point and has an impact now on the kinds of products that retailers will be asking for and manufacturers will be looking to, to sell. Uh, we do anticipate as, as products evolve, 
uh, we started the Best for Kids program with some very stringent criteria, some very narrow criteria. Uh, we recognize now that there have been advancements in uh, cord covers and cord control devices. Uh, there's also um, there's some advancements in, in retractables and short cords. And so uh, we, we need to look at how we can refine the criteria for Best for Kids so that they can also uh, these new innovations that, uh, that, that manufacturers are coming up with can also be incorporated in that program. Um, and we hope that those kinds of criteria uh, are the kinds of things that we'll be able to bring also into the, uh, into the voluntary standard uh, requirements. Okay, we also, um, and I think now uh, we wanted to talk a little bit, uh, each of the, uh, the manufacturers, about some of the things that, that they're working on to try to also Move uh, uh, move forward in that direction. Okay. Sure, no problem. So our business, uh, Rolies Acmeda, we've um, since our last meeting grown, merged with a company based in uh, in Australia, and in Australia they also have child safety issues, as you might imagine. And we have a dedicated innovation and design center. Um, probably houses more engineers than um, any other business in our industry other than some of the folks who are represented here. And so the ever since that transaction and even predating it, so call it two years ago, uh, there, are, there are two themes that define every single uh, new product development project in our company. It has to be child safe and it has to um, be oriented toward energy management Energy management really by definition means it's going to be child safe because you need to take human behavior out of the equation so it's motorized, all right? So to have a true energy efficient system installed in a building means it's, it's motorized. You're not requiring human beings to operate it. So every single new product uh, development project in our company has to get approved by me and pass those very simple criteria. Um, so we've been spending a lot of time, a lot of money on these issues, have for years, but now it's, it's the sole focus of, uh, of the company. Uh, and one of the things you, a couple product categories you heard about from, um, from Ralph, and I brought just a couple of examples because they mean different things to different people. And I just want to make sure that maybe you can get your mind around, you know, what we mean by a shrouded or covered uh, cord because it means different things to different people. Um, what I didn't bring an example of, though, um, w which is it started from a very small base, but the, uh, the increase in this product category is, uh, is truly remarkable, especially for a business or an industry that didn't move all that rapidly for many years, and that's motorization and automation. Um, so as you're seeing everyone in a home wanting lights and thermostats and security systems, um, door locks, they all talk to each other now, uh, maybe through your iPhone, um, but it's, uh, that, that integration is happening extremely rapidly. Um, part of it, some people call it the Internet of Things trend, but the, um, the features in a home that talk to each other really don't do a whole lot of good if they can't talk to the window coverings as well. So, you know, your thermostat is, it, it may be an efficient thermostat like a nest that you're telling, you know, to, um, to not cool the house from 3,000 miles away. But if you can't lower the window coverings, uh, it's just going to have marginal impact because it's got to run at a certain level. So I didn't show you the motors, but we can see from our angle, and I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm sure everyone at this table has seen the, the same thing, and that is a dramatic rise in motorized product. And as you might expect, what that means, there's been a dramatic fall in costs because part of the issue we always have in this industry is scale. <laughs> you know, you have an infinite number of um, combinations of product that can be made on the custom side. And, you know, it's very difficult to have a one-size-fits-all solution. It's not something that you can just put on a shelf and it, you can make a few million of them and they sell. So, you know, we're finally starting to see some of the benefits of that. It's not going to happen overnight, but it's definitely happening. So on the manual side, um, I did bring two examples. I'll stand if that's okay. So when you talk about th this right here is a, I'll try that, is what we call a clutch. And it 
it rotates and will move something up and down. You know, this happens to be one that goes into uh, a roller shade. You have um, different configurations for cellular, uh, for Roman, and other products. Um, but the idea is exactly the same. So you have a continuous loop that's coming out, which is a topic of many discussions um, amongst people in this room. And so, you know, the, the, the discussion when we talk about shrouding or containing uh, the cord is, you know, how do you put a loop, usually a loop, inside of a wand that encloses it? And you're going to have to have an opening because you need a way to access or touch this thing to drive it. And so you've got a wand now that covers it, so it's not accessible. You need to keep the... Um, the chain or the loop inside. And so you can't just take a pipe, as some people have, and attach it to a loop and call it good. Okay, so there's a spring down here that applies constant tension. There's a wheel right there that makes sure that this doesn't fall out when there's slack, all right? So even though it looks very simple, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight parts um, plus the wand in order to make something like this and it has to get assembled. It has to get assembled to size because, you know, up here, you don't want that opening to be big enough to uh, allow a head to fit through it, obviously. So if your window starts up there, um, this wouldn't be very appropriate because you can't reach it, okay? So you're going to need a longer wand. You're going to need the ability to cut it down sometimes uh, or have multiple sizes, certainly, because this right here is going to drive the length of the wand, including the, where, where's the top of the window because that's you know, how you're operating your shade. So other than that, it's actually a very simple, straightforward product. I mean, this then goes on the, on the side of the window covering. There's a handle right here, and there's a, a small engagement point that will grab the, um, the balls. Oops. Oh, and then you just operate the shade like that, OK? And we've got an ADA compliant version, which is a little bit bigger down here, so you know you can grab it because you do need to apply a fair bit of pressure. Um, this is a metal ball, and it doesn't tend to go through as quickly. It makes a bit more noise. Noise is, is a big issue, um, but this is a direction that our company has decided to go. Um, it'll be available for sale and use within the next 60 days or so. Um, but it, it's it's one way of covering a continuous loop and allowing the operation. The other kind of product that you've heard about is a retractable. Um, and you know what we've, um, and this is also, by the way, in production and will be available on a commercial basis, uh, certainly within, within, 90, within 90 days. Um, but just so, I think last time we were here, we attempted to um, show some of the complexity of, of products like this. So you need, because at the end of the day, you're retracting, and this goes back up. So you always have tension on the cord, and when this is released, you don't have any exposed cord. Uh, and I think most people um, in prior discussions agree when there's tension on a cord like that, um, the likelihood of form forming a hazardous loop is low. But, so, but in order to allow this to retract means that you have a very um, highly engineered <laughs> clock spring in here that allows the gathering of the cord, okay? So that's one spring. It's very difficult to make um, because we need to be able to have this work. Some windows get 120, 130 degrees, and we need it to also work when it gets down close to freezing, all right? And that impacts metal differently. Spring steel um, is what we'd be using in here. So this product, we have to have it work for 10,000 up and down cycles. We don't want to sell it otherwise because then it just comes back. And consumers, especially in this country, um, to ride these kinds of products hard. You have to assume they're not going to use it in a delicate manner. So we need it not to break because that obviously creates other issues. We can't have this thing you know, dangling on the ground because we've lost tension in the clock spring. So then we have another spring in here, okay, because what you're doing is you're lowering the shade and you're putting energy inside of a spring in here. Now, depending on the size of the window covering, you need a different size spring. So, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 inches of spring in here that you load when you're, you're lowering the shade. So right now energy is going in and you release it and the energy is being released, okay? 
So that means you've got to be able to properly assess based on the weight of the fabric, the weight of the bottom bar, the size of the shade, how big that spring needs to be. And again, it's got to work 10,000 times up and down. And it has to work in severe temperatures. Okay. And then you move over here, and you have to have the ability for this to stop where you want it to stop on the top. So I've set it for right here. But depending on your window, um, you might want it to go all the way up, or you might want it to you know, be a bit lower. Um, it really just depends on what's at the top of your window, what your preferences are. You might want a permanent um, privacy setting for people who are looking in at a certain angle. So what you have in here then is a break and a stop mechanism because if it flies up too fast, it's going to destroy the window covering pretty quickly. So it goes up in a very slow and controlled manner. If it flies up, it'll break because you're just slamming metal together, you're slamming plastic together. Uh, and I think most of us, at least in childhood and schools, saw what happens to those kinds of window coverings. They're basically viewed as a disposable product because it will break. We can't let this break. So, you know, over here, there's a break and there's a stop because you've got to figure out where you want it to stop on the top. So there's a lot more going on in here <laughs> than you can see. And frankly, at this point, this product is getting, from a cost standpoint, Forget about selling price. From a cost standpoint, very close to a low-end motor system. All right, because they're, as I said, that's kind of coming down. So for our business anyway, you know, this directionally is about as far as we're going to be going, at least based on what we're seeing from uh, a mechanical standpoint. You know, then we're really trying to drive down uh, cost and accessibility and usability on the motor side. Um, so this is our product category. Oops. Sorry. And you can do these in double shades, too. Privacy and sun control. Yeah, Eric, on the lawn, yes. you, uh, is that a product? Is that for new product? Is the lawn for a uh, retrofit or for um, new product? So um, it was designed for new product because, you know, we want to make sure that this opening right here is the proper size if um, you know you are trying to install it on an after-the-fact basis um, you might be relying on the consumer to determine how long this is um, but because you know you figure here's if it's a roller shade it's coming out this way this way you can ship it like that because shipping is obviously an issue all right but this would be you know this product here would get made in 16 to 19 foot lengths and you cut it down to size depending on where the top of the the window is and, and what the consumer wants. So like in some countries they talk about, you know, the bottom of a loop being over a certain level. Um, but that means you're reaching like that. Even I'm reaching like that. And I'm not that, I'm not very tall, but there are plenty of folks shorter than I am. So this product lets it come down to here, which is a more natural way of operating anything, including a shade. Is there any current products out there that would uh, be a retrofit for the current horizontal blinds for the cords? There's a product available. It doesn't work very well, so we're not, um, uh, we're not promoting it yet. Um, you know, this, this for us um, was, was a more important direction to tackle first. Let's see how it works. Let's see what the acceptance is. Derek, I was wondering if you could... Uh, take maybe an extra minute or two to talk about you were talking about the size of the window kind of mm -hmm. became a limiting factor if you could talk it doesn't have to be to the eighth of an inch but about mm -hmm. you know how tall was the window or how wide was the window or you know what were the sure. what became the limits on sure. the the wand in terms of maybe height width weight or you know material or type sure uh, no problem so you've got to look at the retractable device differently um, because that's got the, the spring systems in them, and it really, for us, uh, stopped becoming um, usable, predictable, cost-effective at about 10 feet by 10 feet. So, you know, that'll cover 90 plus percent of windows, but doesn't cover all of them. Um, this wand, on the other hand, um, you know, what, we've got about 50 different, uh, well, uh, if I take color out of the equation, we probably have 20 different clutches. You know, they're geared, they're spring-assisted, they're bigger. 
So um, you can really get, with a manual system, if you spring assist it and using this, you could frankly go as wide as um, 25 by 10. So it's, it's massive. I mean, at that point, you know, you're, you're into the thousands of dollars and you're going to use a motor. You, you will more than likely use a motor. But this doesn't prohibit you from, uh, from a size perspective because you, you work on this side of it here. So you, you get your mechanical advantage and you get a larger pulley driving a smaller tube or you spring assist it. And then all, the, all this is doing is rotating the chain. So anything you can do with a chain today, you can do with this, or a continuous loop, all right? Okay, so th it won't work with cord. Cord is, is too hard to grab, you know, continuous cord loop, but that's a pretty small part of the, the segment. The cord retracting device, would that work for conventional operating system or only for rollers? When you say a conventional operating system, you mean so like a cord lock system? Yes. Um, that could, um, absolutely, it could drive a, what I, I call a mini blind or a horizontal shade. Yep, it can do a, a Roman shade, it can do a cellular shade. I mean, I just happened to show it on a configuration for a roller shade, which, you know, is, is a predominant product category for us. I would, I would add to that simply stating that the internal operating system is different if you're raising a roller shade versus raising a blind. Mm -hmm. So you have to put components that don't exist today in some means for wrapping up cord to use a retractable system mm -hmm. with that type of product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd just like to add on to that because Hunter Douglas has ones for cellular and for blinds as well. Retractable cords exists. It's being sold today. Yeah, they exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess um, going back towards the beginning, Derek, when you were talking about the two things that Roll Lease looks for: mm -hmm. energy management and then child safe. Um, how does your company define child safe? And I guess I was looking at it maybe from you know what are your performance requirements because I think that might be something that might be of interest then, as we're looking. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. down the road on performance requirements, vice design requirements. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I was wondering, you know, how does your company define child safe then? What are the other performance requirements associated with that that perhaps would be of interest? Um, there are. I mean, first and foremost, we look to the current standards. Uh, and, you know, our view is uh, to the extent it goes beyond the standard, it um, gives us an, an edge of some sort. Uh, we know from, um, as you heard before, that retailers are beginning to demand different solutions. Um, so it really helps that it's being, there's a pull as opposed to a push. <laughs> it's very difficult to push something uh, on a customer that maybe, you know, isn't interested in, uh, in buying and is certainly in paying more. But ultimately, if it's being pulled through by the end consumer or the retailer, um, it sure makes life a little bit easier. So now there's... Um, there's a slightly different dynamic in the industry in that regard. So h how do we define it? Um, I don't have a, like a written clear set of instructions and you know, I don't want to say I know it when I see it. It's not um, something along those lines, but it's, uh, for us, it's above and beyond the current set of standards. Now that's for new products. So we still sell, you know, this product with a chain and a tension device as a, um, I'll call it a, the, a mass market product. It's in um, significant demand and it, it definitely uh, works when the tension device is installed. It's, uh, it's safe. Okay, but new products that have come out are be above and beyond that. I have no other questions for Derek. Um, talk a little bit from uh, Springs Window Fashion's perspective. So uh, we recognize that common barriers to product in the marketplace around cordless motorization, really cost is, is number one. Uh, size limits are another. When you think about uh, more complex systems like cordless motorized, uh, even clutch systems, uh, the retractable cords, there's far more components involved and there is a direct relationship between complexity and reliability. I mean, a perceived 
correlation between those things. So typically higher complexity can result in uh, more remakes or more failures to the field. Um, Derek had commented about the, the use uh, people operate window coverings in America and uh, they have to be very robust in their design. Uh, considering that uh, when we go to market with a product like a cordless product, the product today for custom is built around a very broad spectrum of fabrics and colors because this is a fashion industry. And so that also contributes to complexity. So when we look at uh, new development, we're very focused on motorization, of course, because we believe that that's, there's a lot of a future with motorization is overcoming some of these barriers, but still cost is, is very high. Um, but we're looking at how do we cost reduce current cordless systems. Uh, so we're driving towards OPP type product um, so that uh, that will narrow the field. So it may have limitations on the breadth of the product that's being offered and the sizes. Um, I'm sorry, Tom, did you say OP? Oh, I'm sorry, I used an acronym. <laughs> OPP is opening price point. Okay. So it's trying to bring to market lower cost product. And that's done through um, uh, value engineering analysis and applying lean methodologies to product design. So, you know, where you have um, fasteners and, uh, and assembly points, you work at trying to eliminate those into more snap fit versus a fastener, that type of thing. Reduce the number of components, you reduce the cost and the labor that goes into putting those systems together. Um, we've seen uh, cordless grow within our business significantly over the years. We introduced uh, cordless into cellular around 2002, and we've been applying it to every one of our product lines since that time, and we've seen growth go from the, the 5 to 10% uh, penetration to well over 60%. So we continue to see a lot of growth in those products as cordless. So we, um, we're in, uh, heavily engaged in the value analysis that goes on in redesigning of products and new systems. Uh, what, w what would the price point be for um, a value, uh, I guess, a low end uh, cordless system? How much would that cost for the consumer? Well, it's, it's a little difficult to put a price tag on things because it's usually viewed as a percent of product cost. And uh, entry-level type products can be anywhere from 20% minimum to 50% of the product cost as a cordless. So um, it, it's a very wide range. It really depends on the base product that, that you're trying to apply this operating system to. Uh, I'd like to take an opportunity to answer the question too about safety as, as it was asked about, you know, what do we use for criteria? We rely heavily on the safety standard and looking beyond that too. So there are some products that we would evaluate that might pass the standard as it's written, but we might see that there's, um, you know, possible misuse or, or improper use of products. So we try to design around that as well. But that really becomes the uh, central point when we're doing design work. We have a stage gate process that we follow, and we do technical reviews, and we review all requirements for product, not just the fashion elements, but also the safety. And so we take those into consideration, and they must pass those requirements, the safety standing being the, the primary one that we give strong consideration to through the design process. Any questions for me? You mentioned over 60% cordless. Does it refer to the cellular or honeycomb shape? That's only? primarily cellular, yes. Okay. We've seen a lot of growth in other product categories. As I mentioned earlier, um, you have some mature categories like horizontals where being very mature, they're more commodity price driven as far as consumers making choices. And you, you, we've seen a lot of growth in the cordless option, but still a lot of growth on a small percent isn't significant to the overall. Um, but shades, and, and keep in mind too that, you know, the basic difference between blinds and shades, blinds are like horizontals where you have a louver, so they're not operated up and down as often as a shade would be because a shade, in order to manage light and privacy, you have to fully operate it, but with a horizontal blind or a vertical blind, all you have to do is tilt or rotate the louvers. And so there's less of an incentive to add cost into a product as simple as that to, to make it cordless. Any other questions for me? 
Well, on the on the horizontals, I mean, from what we had in our ANPR, even we know from the data that a lot of the strangulations, unfortunately, occur with horizontals. So I guess when we're looking at it, um, you know, what are you know what are the opportunities or what are there to go towards something? And I'm not saying cordless specifically, but you know, what are the opportunities with horizontal blinds to specifically address exposed operating cords? You know, keeping, not trying to get design specific, but I guess, you know, at a broader sense, what are some of the opportunities there then? Here, he, you know, hearing what you're saying about it's growing, but it's a small percent to start. Yeah, it's still, f from, from our perspective, um, trying to add complexity to those systems is very expensive, not in just from, you know, the parts that you're putting in, but to the end, end consumer. And, you know, it's hard to overcome something as simple as a cord lock because you're, you're literally looking at 25 cents or, or maybe even less than that to manage uh, cord control. So uh, that becomes a huge challenge. You know, how do you, how do you look at that and, and change it, cover the cords? We've seen operating systems that have been introduced that do that. And quite honestly, from my experience, they're difficult to retrofit and they're difficult to operate. And that becomes a barrier as well. I mean, when a consumer goes to purchase window coverings, it's a, it can be a very big decision for them financially. And to think that they could be replacing 20 window coverings in a house easily, um, it just magnifies with that additional cost throughout. So it just becomes a very big challenge as to how do you, how do you replace those types of operating systems. There are systems like retractable cords that can be fitted, but you're adding a lot of complexity to that system. Did I answer your question? Yeah. You, you did. I mean, I guess, so if, if I'm hearing, there's almost like a step function increase in terms of if you're addressing it from horizontal, uh, for horizontal blinds, there's not a small tweak or change to go from removing an exposed or accessible operating cord. You're looking at a large step increase, if you will, in complexity. To, you, to in get my there, mind, you so. are, and that's where our focus has been. Is that we're focused on on cordless systems, um, re revising for better reliability, revising for lower cost. Those are the focus points for us. Motorization still that's a hard sell into that type of product because of it being more like a commodity. Mm -hmm. what, what we're seeing is. Um, I mean, some of these, these retrofitter devices that will um, cover the cord and allow you to operate it, the operating cord, costs more than the underlying product itself, um, almost sometimes a factor of two. <laughs> so that's some of the challenge that, uh, that Tom was just referring to. But, uh, but, George, I think from an overall standpoint, not to get maybe company-specific here, but what I'm being told from from various excuse me various members is that they're looking at to control the cords on a typical you know uh, single cord or multi cord cord lock system. They're looking at a true cordless system. They're looking at um, shrouds and or retractable to make the cord inaccessible. Um, and they're looking at some combination of technology to use a cordless system with a short cord. So from a from a from a, um, an umbrella standpoint, those are the kinds of areas that the investigation is going on, um, and it may it may be different for different types of products. Um, but if you can't go without an operating cord, then how do you cover it, or how do you shorten it, or how do you attract it? Any other questions for me? Not that you can't ask a question later; I'll answer it, but. <laughs> I was going to ask whether you see any trends in terms of the horizontal blind sales. Is uh, it as prominent as before? Is it increasing or decreasing? What no, no. As far as the category yes. of horizontal, horizontal blinds, blinds, no. I, I don't believe that that's a growing category. Um, there are other product categories that are on a, a, you know, a trend, trending up on terms of sales. Horizontals is is really almost. Re I don't want to say restricted to commercial, but that's where a lot of the business has been. It's a very simple solution for, for many consumers to pick a horizontal 
blind, but um, Shades, for instance, is one that is kind of uh, taking market away from products like horizontals, and that's because of the, again, it's a fashion-driven industry, and so it all, uh, there's a lot of uh, energy-related benefits that you get from, you know, solar roller shades that tend to be replacing those types of horizontal products in the marketplace. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. So. Um, following Derek and Tom, uh, we're going to talk about a lot of the same things. Uh, we're focused on three areas, motorization, retractable cords, and cordless systems. That's our main thrust at this point. A lot of it is cost reductions. Uh, as they both mentioned, they're all expensive systems. We're increasing the cost on all of them by putting those lift systems in the shades. Um, with regard to horizontals, we do have a retractable cord device that uh, pumps up the horizontal blind, whether it be a wood blind or a, a metal blind. But um, frankly, people don't raise and lower them very much. So it's hard for them to justify the extra cost. You put a, a $25 motor in there, a spring motor, and then you never use it. So it does take the cords away, but it doesn't really get used very often. So. Um, Basically, we designed it, engineered it, built it, and then a lot of people aren't buying it. That's the end result. Um, last year, we launched our PowerView motorization product, which is uh, through your cell phone, uh, home automation systems across all of our product lines. And so that's selling really well. Um, our job right now is to cost reduce that so that a lot more people can afford it. Um, working on other motorization systems uh, for tilting for horizontal blinds, uh, those kinds of applications, so you get rid of those tilt cords or even the wand that people don't like. Um, yeah, mostly it is uh, re-engineering the things that we've engineered in the past. Uh, like they said, take the fabrication labor out, have snap fits rather than screws. I think you guys saw those storyboards I put together uh, before with all the complication and all the different parts on them. Um, we're trying to take a lot of that com complexity out. Uh, there's also governors. Uh, when you uh, click it and walk away, the shade, you don't want it to just fall like a rock. So you have to govern the um, load as it comes down, trying to reduce the cost of those governors. So there's a lot of tooling involved. There's a lot of engineering involved and testing. Uh, getting onto the testing as well. We have a stage gate process as well. Um, we rely on the standard heavily. We've got a test lab that goes through the standard with the head probe testing, the hazardous loop testing, accessibility testing. We've got UV uh, exposure, um, impact testing, all those things that are in the standard we test in our lab, lead testing even. Um, and it's in our quality process that uh, child safety is one of those uh, criteria that a product doesn't go out into the market unless it passes all those tests. So, since similar question, so for Hunter Douglas, when you when you say child safety, how does Hunter Douglas define child safety as one of the requirements before it goes out? Well, the the current thrust is to get rid of cords completely, as far as uh, lift systems with being a spring assist. Um, retractable cord driven and motorization and um, at this point we're not launching any new products with uh, those the cord locks we've got multiple products on the uh, agenda and none of those have cord locks uh, as the part of the plan can, can you um, expand on that just so I make sure I got it so from Hunter Douglas's perspective all new products being launched don't have an accessible cord with them um, I would just say cord locks. Or cord, cord locks. Yes. Okay. So, what what cord, or maybe help me visualize because I'm multiple visual. Multiple cords coming out of the head rail mm -hmm. to a joiner, and then maybe a single pull cord afterward. Um, we're not launching any new products with that. Okay. So, so what does still have a cord then? In our product or line. Nothing. I'm um, just trying to make sure I get the scope. There's some legacy products still that have those. Uh, cords in in them 
um, and we're diligently working to try to replace those with uh, new solutions too. So I'm not on those teams, but I know that that's the um, thrust of the company is to get rid of those. Do you have any demos? Not right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> Derek ah. brought props, so I thought maybe other people brought props too. Well, I was thinking about it, but I'd have to pack my suitcase full of them, so I didn't. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jeff Stout with uh, Level or Window Fashions, and uh, we face uh, we face a lot of the same challenges as everybody else. So the complexity of the cordless systems. Um, working to really cost reduce that. Um, we've tried multiple solutions over the years. We've taken a lot of products to consumer research. Um, what we've typically found out is consumers like the simple operation that they're always used to. They don't like uh, some gimmick operation. They prefer a uh, standard product and they prefer it to be uh, as low cost as possible. And uh, so we put a lot of our focus on uh, reducing the complexity of the systems to reduce the cost of the systems and to try and bring the the added cost of the cordless systems in line with uh, what they would more typically be paying for a corded system. Um, so that's a lot of our engineering effort. We operate very similar to most of these folks, stage gate engineering system. We have our own internal test lab. Um, you know, we, we work, we partner with uh, companies across the globe on development. Um, it's a it's uh, one of our key focuses, obviously, is to try and have the best solution, the most reliable solution at the lowest cost to the consumer. And uh, I know we last spoke in a forum like this on May 26th of 2015. I was wondering if you could uh, have any more additional detail about maybe what Levelor has done in the last, uh, you know, 16 months or so, or what are some of the areas that Levelor is focused in terms of defining either child safe internally, how Levelor approaches, you know, child safety in the development? Yeah, so in general, we focus our new product development on cordless solutions or solutions that meet uh, the set best for kids uh, criteria. Um, we work on motorized systems, but quite honestly, we won't sell very many of those because we're not a high priced, uh, we don't compete in that market very strongly. We do have a presence there, but we won't sell a lot of those units for a while until we can get the cost down. Um, you know, just cost reducing our existing models. Um, we literally just had line review with Lowe's recently, so it's hard to say what exactly will be on shelves. Um, in the next time period, but uh, we've presented them with uh, numerous options at a at a substantially better cost than what they've seen in the past. And so that's really our focus is to make the solutions more cost affordable and to drive that market penetration of the uh, cordless solutions. Is there a chance for any of the low cost um, current um, horizontal blinds to be within the same price range within maybe, I don't know, ten five to ten dollar range of a cordless horizontal blind. Because I want to see if, I guess this is for anyone, is, is it possible or are you guys coming up with anything that would address the horizontal uh, corded issue? So we are on the low end scale. So, you, so a couple points, yes we are working on that system specifically the horizontal mini blind system but no we're not to the 10 percent range yet we're still in the range that tom mentioned and it depends on the size if it's vinyl or metal they can go out to 72 inches wide or they can be less than two feet wide and so that price range is still 20 to 50 percent range um, but that is that is better than it was a year ago and i i assume that will continue to get better each year quite honestly yeah, I guess that's my uh, follow-up on this. Uh, you know, several of you mentioned, you know, that you're driving your your new development is focusing on this and on value engineering uh, specifically within the cordless. You know, do you see 
in one year, two years, you know, uh, is there a, a point in time where you think these new innovations are coming to market that will reduce that uh, increment? I don't think it will ever get to a zero cost adder, but I do think it, it, at some point it becomes the new norm and it, uh, you know, it, it gets enough market penetration to where it's not, it's, it is the conversation at that point. And if you can get it down to the range you're talking about 10%, then, then it's pretty easily, pretty easy for the consumer to make that uh, um, gap in, in uh, logic for the 10%, right? I just wonder if you foresee uh, how long out you're forecasting that. Uh, it's hard to say, quite honestly. I, I would say that um, it's very difficult because of the product types to, to say specifically what cost comes out. I can say with a, with a degree of confidence that when you look at a, at a what is the cost of cordless in a system? Um, it's difficult, you know, I, I should say, I should look at it this way. When you look at the cost adder that cordless has over a corded system, about the best that I can see that you're going to be able to do through just value engineering is taking about half of that difference out because you cannot get away from the fact that you have to have certain components make up a cordless system. You have to have a spooling system. You have to have some type of a spring motor. Um, these are basic components. And so you, you will not, as, as Jeff had just stated, you're not going to get to a zero net. It's just it's not possible um, and still be able to accomplish the same function of, of raising and lowering the blind or shade. Um, also, trying to get to how long does that take, it's not unusual, um, depending upon are you making a minor change to something? It could be three to six months from the time that you get product changed to the time that you get it integrated into the field. But a true development, if you're really starting from scratch, it could be easily 18 months before you are able to bring something to market. Um, and it's all very reliant on, on what is it that you're changing? What are you affecting in that process? Joel, also, I think, um, and again, I'm speaking much more broadly and without any knowledge of exact details of design or, or cost, but I think what we're talking about is not all cost-driven, okay? There's a, there's a certain amount of this that's cost-driven where, you know, value engineering and cost of components and, and complexity comes down, but then there's also the demand side. And so to the extent that we can con continue to drive the demand side and the acceptance of cordless options and have the retailers be uh, partners in that, uh, we think will create perhaps a new floor uh, so that um, in, in a certain period of time, people won't be comparing between you know, the lowest cost cord lock system that they ever saw and these newer designs that uh, that that you know promote the, uh, the the goals that we're trying to promote here. So I think it's a it's a combination of of driving cost out. It's also a combination of of driving demand up, and um, and so I think that's important. It's a it's it's both parts of the equation in order for us to to be able to accomplish that. We spend a lot of time in working with other participants in the industry, showing them options and very often you've got to uh, develop it to a point where it works. I mean what you saw that I just showed you that had all 3D printed parts. Um, you know 3D printing's come a long way and it's allowed us to move a lot faster um, but it, it, it still is an, an 18 month process and um, to bring a more complex system from an engineering standpoint um, to be ready for market uh, it can easily consume over a million dollars. Um, that's tooling, that's engineering, uh, investment, and so on. Uh, and frankly, you know, it's not just the manufacturing side, as, as Ralph just mentioned. There's got to be demand. And so, you know, we've um, taken a flyer, if you will, on a number of uh, products over the years that were uh, child safe, well beyond what is currently in the standard. 
um, tooled them up um, and showed them to a combination of participants in the industry, including retailers. Uh, and then ultimately they make the decision on whether they're going to put it on their shelves or offer it. Uh, and, you know, really until recently, the answer's usually been, that's cool, come back and see us, you know, in a year or two or three. Um, we don't think it's going to sell. Um, but, you know, we're getting a lot more um, of an open mind and a better reception nowadays. Um, but it's, t you know, it's been, it's been a long road with a whole lot of, frankly, um, sunk investment that, you know, we, we won't recover, but we were willing to make. It's, but that's the nature of, of this process. We can't just build it and they will come. And that's where I think, um, uh, as we talk a little bit about the standard, uh, the standard has to play a role in that as well. Voluntary standard has to play a role in that as well. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe this is a good time just to, to kind of go over the objectives of the standard. Uh, you know, first and foremost, the primary goal of the next revision is to address the risk of strangulation to young children from operating courts. Um, we, uh, you know, we, we have been talking in terms of uh, cordless and inaccessible cords and short cords and whatever the combination of that, uh, that, that, that's, that uh, scenario needs to be. Um, we want to maintain a performance-based standard to uh, ensure that advances in technology to address the strangulation risk to young children can be tested for compliance so that they can be brought quickly to market. So we don't want the standard to be in any way an impediment to somebody bringing something to market and, and getting it uh, tested and, and, and accepted quickly. Um, where possible, uh, we would like to simplify the process to demonstrate compliance. Um, you know, we have gotten comments from time to time that the standard is, uh, can be complex to understand. We want to make it uh, as simple as possible to understand so that people understand what, what's involved in complying. Um, and we're also looking at exploring the possibility of a joint standard development with the Canadian Standard Association. And we've spoken with uh, the Standards uh, Council of Canada on various approaches that we might be able to, uh, to take so that we can, <clears throat> and whether that turns out to be a single document, two documents, uh, you know, jointly developed documents, we're not really sure yet, but we know that we have the support of, uh, of ANSI and the Standards Council of Canada in exploring that uh, to the fullest so that we'll have no gap uh, between the jurisdictions and the requirements and the timing, uh, interpretation uh, of the standard, and we think that that's, uh, that's a good thing uh, all around. Um, you know, but the main goal, going back, George, before I talk a little bit more about the, the, the process, is that, uh, that this revision, um, you know, will address the risk of strangulation to young children from certain operating courts. Um, in terms of the process, um, you know, we'll utilize, uh, you know, once again, we'll utilize the ANSI uh, Canvas, you know, standard development uh, process. Uh, as, uh, as you stated at the beginning, um, you know, we've worked with CPSC and many of the stakeholders uh, here, and we will continue to reach out and do that uh, and have them as part of the process. Um, um, the standard will be performance-based. We will not be uh, looking at prescriptive requirements. Um, you know, new developments on, on operating systems and cord control systems, much like what we've seen here and talked about here. Um, you know, will be, uh, you know, will be um, uh, uh, hopefully uh, uh, available to, to meet those performance requirements, um, you know, where appropriate. And we can model and, and use uh, charts and flow charts and graphs to make it very easy for somebody to follow. If this, then that, uh, you know, we'll do that. Um, we also think, and in, in, in a couple of the questions that you uh, that you brought up, um, you know, go to the heart of this, but we'll be looking at um, product segmentation approaches. Uh, you know, can, uh, are there uh, approaches available in product segmentation uh, that we can evaluate to determine which might have the greatest impact? Um, recognizing that, as, as, as Tom has said and, and others, uh, in, in terms of, uh, of product categories, there's still some products and still some applications that might need a corded system of some type, and how do you get, how do you get that involved? But we would be looking at um, product categories in, in terms of, of how to segment or, or potentially segment product categories, 
operating systems might be another one, applications and uses of products, uh, distribution channels, um, location in the home, uh, and then as you uh, started to ask, George, size, weight, uh, geometry, configuration, um, and so all of those we think are um, are opportunities to evaluate, um, you know, where we can make the most impact on the on the greatest number of products that are going into the market. Um, you know, recognizing that there there will be some exceptions, uh, but I think that that's uh, that's really what we're trying to uh, uh, to do, which is why uh, you referenced the press release that uh, you know we think that this next revision of the standard is going to have a major impact in that area. No, thanks, Ralph. And we've had a lot of conversations on this over the last 16 months or so, and you know I think we all appreciate the engineering challenges on the window coverings. And I appreciate the fact that in looking at this, when we talk about the risk of strangulation from window coverings, we all recognize that it's a not a one-size-fits-all solution and that the time has come that we not wait until we have a window covering design that fits everything. In other words, we're going to have to look at you know, for each of the window coverings, what are the different ways we can manage the risk, whether it's a roller shade, whether it's a horizontal blind, you know, whether it's a, a continuous bead loop. You know, there's going to be different ways to manage the risk, and it's really important that we sit down and as we break them out, look at how can we manage the risk, because we all know that there isn't one window covering type that fits all of them, addresses all of them. But at the same point in time, we can't, you know, wait until it's developed to that point. And I guess maybe from each of the companies, um, as we've talked today, I've heard a lot about, you know, um, defining child safe and how it's dependent on the standard. And I guess what I was interested in from um, each of y'all as the industry members is from what you've seen and learned over the last 16 months since our last meeting, what do you see specifically that you then, you know, bring to the voluntary standard, you know, to improve the voluntary standard so that raises your or improves your definition of child safe? So that's kind of my question is from the last meeting in May till now, what have each of you kind of specifically seen that you plan to bring to the voluntary standard that, ra you know, raises that, you know, definition of child safe, which you kind of described as being dependent on the voluntary standard? Um, I'll, I'll speak first on this, that, you know, I, I really look at this in two ways, right? So there's products where you don't have a lot of penetration, um, maybe not a lot of awareness. So how do you, how do you bring awareness to that? And, and on the other side of that, best for kids, which, you know, in the last um, 12 months that, that was um, brought forth, published in May, of last year, so there hasn't been a lot of exposure to it, but yet um, retailers have uh, embraced it. They understand it. It's simple, and so they're using that as a means to to help build awareness through their markets, through their distribution points. Um, so those are the types of things that that we look to, as well as as we've already spoken about how do you how do you affect the barriers that that prevent people from just accepting cordless across the board and cost is a big part of that and so we have a lot of emphasis a lot of investment going into that um, again on cordless on motorized type systems in order to help um, make those help overcome those barriers to, to to purchase for the consumer i think from our standpoint we've had um, really dozens of uh, prototypes ideas that we've been able to talk to either focus groups, retailers, and others about. And I think um, there's a, a much greater awareness on our part of what they like and don't like. Um, again, as I said before, it was much more of a, um, we're the engineers here, we'll design it, and um, you, know, you, you guys should buy it because it's safe or it's cool or whatever the feature might be. Um, so there's a lot more collaboration in the industry now. There's, um, uh, there, there's real feedback we've gotten. Um, on the, the spring-loaded system or spring-supported system in some way, um, that was a big learning curve. I mean, it, you know, the, 
there were certainly spring systems available before, but um, now they're interacting with wands and with, with other devices. Um, how do you make that consumer friendly, um, affordable, and, and explainable for a retailer? Uh, if there's too much complexity, they struggle, frankly, selling it. Um, so I, I, you know, I th there's been a, a big learning curve in, in that regard in, in the direction of uh, what I would consider to be very promising new tech, not new, uh, ed improved technologies. So we could bring that to the table. Um, <clears throat> I've had a couple of meetings with our test lab, uh, two four-hour meetings actually, to, to go through the standard step-by-step -step definitions test procedures, all the different protocols that are in the, the standard to find out what they would like to see, you know, try and be a sounding board. And uh, so I think simplification of the standard is something that we could bring, uh, help to make it more streamlined and smooth uh, for the test technicians, work with Bureau Veritas and Intertech on how they test things, trying to compare notes what result did you get? What result did we get? Are we actually synchronizing those results? You know, how come we thought it was okay and they thought it failed? Those kinds of, of uh, complexities. So I think we can simplify that and harmonize with Canada. That would be helpful as well. And uh, how do you see the intersection between simplifying the standard, harmonizing with Canada, and addressing the, better addressing the strangulation risk? I think I was uh, focusing on how the testing gets done more than uh, from an overall company strategy. Yeah, from my viewpoint, uh, the, the current testing complexity makes it more difficult for the R&D teams to develop products and to test it. If you, if you build a prototype and you test it one time and it's close to passing or failing, you can't t use that same product again. You have to create an entire new prototype because it performs differently each time each additional time you test it. You get variability between labs in Asia and the U.S. and just depends on who's doing the test, how long have they been doing it. Um, those types of things just add complexity to the product development process in general and uh, certainly don't help us move any faster. So it's like sure. with finite resources, it's distracting or inefficient then when you've got? Yes, it, it's okay. a, it is certainly a challenge. L um. I'm going to just try to wrap, make a little bit of wrap up here, and then maybe we could take a quick break before we finalize, please. Sure. Okay. Um, I think, you know, we're, we may be getting focused on some, some of the technical issues. Your question really is how are we going to bring new innovations to the voluntary standard process, okay, and how are we going to, how are we going to address that? And I think that our focus coming into this revision process, as we've, as we've said, is cordless, inaccessible cords, short cords incapable of forming a hazardous loop. How many products can be impacted by that set of criteria? Okay. And so the technical folks will have to work within the context of, but that's really, if we're looking at a goal, of attacking those those operating cords, it's how many of those how many of those products can be made cordless, can have inaccessible cords of the type that that we've we've seen or, or heard about today, or can be some combination of of uh, short cords that can't form a hazardous loop. And um, you're right, there is no one product that can handle that. There is no one operating system that can handle that. But if we if we look at that, then uh, and, and we look at some of the uh, some of the approaches that we we can take, you know, what, that people have suggested over the, the, the years in terms of different types of segmentation and not re recognizing that not every every uh, configuration of every product could meet that, but work on what's the greatest impact that we can bring. I think that's the focus that we're trying to to, to bring, and that's really an outgrowth of the, the, the original criteria that we had with the Best for Kids and that we're looking to expand uh, as we go forward. So let me ask a question, George. So I'm the engineer that's uh, going to, to work with the standards or my group is going to work with the standards. 
I'm not hearing too much I'm not hearing too much direction on where the standard is going or where you're going to bring the standard that's going to result in safer products for for window window blinds. Cordless inaccessible cords sh short cords that can't form a hazardous loop. I think that's a direction. And if you have a cordless system or you have a system that has inaccessible cords, or you have a system that has a short cord that can't form a hazardous loop, I think that's speaking directly to the direction. So are we looking at uh, when we do open the sta when you do open the standard, you're looking at uh, developing requirements that will ensure that those are products that are uh, are um, going to be made to to that standard. That's that, a, that, that's a, that? that's the direction that we're 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 looking at. We're looking Good. at how do we make the biggest impact to allow those kinds of systems to impact the greatest number of products. I I guess uh, uh, to clarify that in terms of how to make the greatest impact. So you're saying the the approach is is getting rid of the hazardous loops essentially through those several things you just described. So are you saying the how to address the maximum impact is in terms of the segmentation, how to segment? It could be segmentation. It could be operating systems. It could be a number of different things. That, that's really you know, going to be the, some of the technical people bringing that what's the, the, the greatest feasibility. But that's the end result that we're looking for. So you're not looking at 100% cordless or retractable or short cords, so there will still be some exceptions. I believe there will be. I don't, I don't, I, I don't believe that there's 100, as George said, there's not 100% available for every product category. But I think, you know, certainly as we brought up in the data before in the previous discussions, there's an opportunity to make sure we overlay, to your point on, addressing the greatest need, you know, not addressing a need just based on you know, commercial availability or sales, but um, on the type, especially based on what we're seeing in the data, I think there's a real opportunity here mm -hmm. to make sure we overlay those on top of each other. I mean, we talked briefly about horizontal blinds before. The reason we talked about horizontal blinds is from the data we know, that's one of the, you know, uh, major blind types where we've seen fatalities with the, with the cord. It used to be Roman shades. There was a real effective effort to address Roman shades, gosh, probably well over a decade ago. Now, you know, it's still in the data, but not, not the same way. Right. So, um, you know, from our perspective, I think, you know, making sure with the with the data. I think it's that the same type of analysis, George. Mm -hmm. Same type of analysis process. Right, and just uh, following up on that, well, it, it, I think uh, uh, several people mentioned the uh, desire to, you know, get this maximum benefit. You know, now that the time has come, uh, by you know what what we're able to achieve now, but I, w I wonder if there's a view towards you know what that next step would be after that. Would there be a plan to then you know follow up with you know perhaps additional segments, additional operating systems down the road? Uh, Joel, as we've learned over the years, I don't think this is a category where we're ever done. So I would imagine that, um, that, you know, as things develop over, over the, the next generation, right now I'd like to get this next revision out. Fair enough. Take five minutes. Go ahead. Right before the break, Ralph, you had said two things. One, you needed a five-minute break, and then the second thing is you had uh, some kind of I just wanted to, closing uh, type remark. So I wanted to pick up there. Um, yes, I think that um, um, one of the things that I wanted to just uh, reiterate is the, the goal for the standard development, which is to reduce the risk of strangulation. Um, and, uh, and we also look forward to working with, uh, with all of you um, on this process. Um, we will uh, we'll use the, the ANSI process. We'll look at all kinds of developments that, that have been talked about today and then others. Um, we will look at various approaches to how we address the standard. 
Um, product segmentation will be one of those aspects that we look at, look at in addition to the, um, uh, the, the technical aspects. So very, various approaches will be evaluated. I went through the list before, so just to reiterate, product categories, uh, we'll look at operating systems, uh, applications and uses, uh, distribution channels such as stock versus custom, uh, location in the home, size and weight of products, um, and, uh, and the ability of products to be readily adapted to some of the new technologies. And, and really what we want to look at, um, George, I think speaks to your point, we want to look at uh, which of these or which combination of these has the greatest impact um, you know, on, the, on the, uh, the products that are going in the market and the greatest penetration of products that go into the market. Um, having said that, you know, next steps, um, you know, we'll begin the, uh, the development process, uh, convene uh, the steering committee, establish the canvas body, uh, determine the feasibility of developing the joint standard with CSA in, in some concrete terms. Uh, establish meeting dates, timelines, milestones, and, and, and the formal reviews, uh, develop uh, the key actions uh, that we have, assign ownership throughout the committee, engage retailers and, and other key stakeholders to gain consensus. Um, you know, and last but not least, our goal and our target, which is a very aggressive one, is to have a standard ready to submit for ANSI ballot by the end of this year. So, um, we, uh, we, uh, we, in concluding, we thank you for having us, uh, for allowing us to come in. Uh, we look forward to working with you, um, and uh, and we're all going to have to work together if we're going to, if we're going to achieve this very aggressive goal. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph, and uh, you know from the CPSC staff side again, thank you for. Um, you know, at the end of June, announcing initiating the revision of the voluntary standard is something that staff and you've been working on, I think, since the day after the last standard was published back in 2012. I think that was the next day's letter. Um, so staff is certainly looking forward to the opportunity, you know, to, to work with you all on this. Um, you know, with respect to the segmentation, again, you know, looking at how do we, and, and, you know, we understand it's a very fragmented market. There's a lot of different window operating types. There's different sizes. Um, within the home, you know, there's different rooms with different window covering types. How do we really uh, segment it so that we most effectively address the strangulation risk to young children in the home? You know, kind of difficult, and I we but and we appreciate how difficult that problem can be. And um, but we also, I think, from the last couple of years, have shown that we're more than willing to step up with you, have other stakeholders step up with you and the industry, and really address it and develop this time around a standard that effectively addresses the risk of strangulation to young children in the home. So thank you all again for the time. It's good to see you again after uh, so many months and have another uh, meeting. And uh, with that, I'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you all.